Darts results are in. It hammered Dimorphos. The moon might just be a big chunk of the Earth. Webb sees bizarre rings around a star, and SLS gets a new launch date at night. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years, and this is our Space Bites. Short, bite-sized information nuggets of space and astronomy news. All right, let's get into the news. Dart, success. Well, it's been a couple of weeks since we talked about NASA's Dart mission to hammer a asteroid with a spaceship. And the big question was, did it have an impact? And the answer is, it really had an impact. Now, engineers at NASA were hoping that they might see a few seconds of a change in the amount of time that it takes for Dimorphos to orbit around Didymus. Their maximum amount of time they were hoping was 10 minutes, but anything beyond 73 seconds, they would consider that a success. It would give them enough of an understanding of what it might take to move an asteroid the size of Dimorphos. Well, the results are in, and it shifted the orbit by 32 minutes. So it shortened the orbital time by 32 minutes. That's a lot. That's like three times more than NASA's greatest hopes. I feel like the dinosaurs were revenged on this one. And so now we're waiting for the Hera mission from the European Space Agency to do a follow up flyby, be able to give us some actual images to see how much damage was done to the asteroid. And from this now astronomers have a much better idea of what it's going to take to move a dangerous asteroid. And so in the future, if we discover that something is going to be coming uncomfortably close to Earth, we've got a sense of the amount of mass of an impact that we might have to send to push the asteroid off of its trajectory. So congratulations to everyone at the DART mission. Dinosaurs, that one was for you. And here's to future missions to try and really wrap our heads around what it's going to take to get control and remove one existential threat from the future of humanity. The moon might be a large chunk of the Earth after all. So where did the moon come from? Now there are a few theories to explain this There's like three main theories. The first one is that the Earth captured the moon. Of course, there were a lot of objects in the early solar system buzzing around we can see just on the amount of impact craters on Mars, on the moon, even on Earth, that the early period of the solar system, there was a lot of objects. And so it's possible that the Earth captured the moon gravitationally and kept it in orbit. The other possibility is that the moon formed as the Earth formed. And so as the Earth was starting to spin up, a blob of material was birthed out of the out of the Earth and then drifted away and then formed into its own sphere as a satellite around the Earth and just kept going farther and farther away. But the main theory that most people believe is that the moon was formed when a Mars sized object crashed into the Earth billions of years ago. And this is the impact hypothesis. And the main piece of evidence to support the impact hypothesis actually came from the Apollo landings. There's this great scene in from the Earth to the moon, where they teach these astronauts really how to be geologists. And when they're on the moon, one of the astronauts sees a rock that is the kind of rock that he should be looking for, brings it home, and they discover that this rock has exactly the right kind of geological information to tell them that the moon has the same isotope ratios of oxygen in it that the Earth does. In other words, the Earth and the moon were once the same object. And so you can imagine this Mars age object crashed into the Earth, blasted out a debris of lava and material out into space. And then that collected together into the moon that we see today. Now, We've talked about this a bit in the past, maybe it's more on the question show, but you can't kick something into orbit with just one kick. You need multiple maneuvers to make something be 
orbital. Otherwise, everything is suborbital. And so when you think about this giant impact crashing into the Earth, blasting out all this material, most of the material would have come back down on a suborbital trajectory to hit the Earth. But the theory was that these little particles were interacting with each other and balancing out some of their orbital speed, and some were able to remain in orbit. And then that material through mutual gravity pulled itself into a sphere. So that was kind of the main theory. But there are a few issues with the orbital trajectory of the moon that astronomers felt that original impact hypothesis just couldn't explain. And one of the big ones is the orbital inclination of the moon. It is not on the plane, the same plane, the orbital plane as the Earth, it's tilted. And so this new theory, a new paper just came out where astronomers ran a bunch of simulations. And what they found was that the thing that explained both the existence of the moon and these other mysteries is if once again, a Mars sized object crashed into the Earth, blasted off two giant chunks of the Earth into space. The first one, the much larger one didn't get quite as high. And it then crashed back down into the Earth. But it was able to give a lot of momentum to the smaller chunk that was higher. And that ended up turning into the moon. And so the moon formed in a matter of minutes, not centuries as originally believed and that there was actually two large chunks, the one chunk helped kick the moon into this higher, more stable orbit where it is today. Very fascinating. More evidence is needed. This is not an optical illusion. This is a real star. Back in August, we saw this really cool picture come out of the James Webb Space Telescope. And actually, Judy Schmidt, who I've mentioned several times in the past, was one of the citizen scientists who found this image in the James Webb data and cleaned it up and, st and stacked the images together and pulled out this really weird concentric circle image. And when you first look at this, you think this is some kind of image artifact, some kind of chromatic aberration, something that is just caused by the lenses and the light, you know, some kind of lens flare. But no, this is a real thing. And since then, astronomers have a chance to go through and examine the data and figure out what's going on. And so what is it? It's a type of star called a wolf Rye star. It's a very young, hot star, very massive. There's actually two stars in this system, and they're orbiting around a common center of gravity. As the one star orbits around about every eight years, it gets closer and closer to the other star. And as it does, it kicks out this giant cloud of dust off of the star. Then it drags this cloud of dust along with it in orbit goes all the way around the star comes back eight years later, kicks up a new cloud of dust, drags that cloud of dust out. All the while, the combined light pressure from these two stars is pushing this clouds, these rings out farther and farther from the stars. And so what you're looking at is more than 100 years of these interactions between these two stars every eight years kicks out another ring, the ring gets pushed outward. And when you think about it, it's kind of like the concentric rings on a tree where you can count the number of rings and that tells you how old the tree is. But in this case, you can count the rings and see how long they've been interacting until the dust fades away into space. But still, sort of a similar mechanism going on here. And I've never seen anything like this. So congratulations to everybody involved who found the object, identified it, understood it, and it turned into a science paper. Now I mentioned Judy Schmidt. She was the one, the citizen scientist who did a lot of the behind the scenes image processing work on this. And she's done a ton of amazing image work. And actually I'm going to be interviewing her next week. And so we'll get an interview with her and, and hopefully she can teach us all how to find this kind of data, how to process it, how to be able to look at it and understand it, and maybe create some of these images of our own. So look forward to that interview. Mega rocket updates. I'm sure you're just waiting to hear what's going on with the space launch system now that it's gone back to the vehicle assembly building. Engineers have worked on it, recharged the batteries on the payloads, made sure that all of the parts are functioning and they've got a new launch date for SLS. It's going to be on Monday, November 14th at 12.07 AM Eastern time. And that's exciting because it's a night launch. 
Normally, we see these rockets launch in the daytime, but a night launch is pretty special. It's quite spectacular because they're so bright. They leave this really bright trail in the sky as they fly. I obviously, I think people would like to be able to see the weather, see what the clouds are doing, but the way the orbit of the moon and the, the position of the Earth on this day line up, the night launch is the one that makes the most sense. So hopefully on November 14th, we will see SLS lift off. And I stand by my original prediction, which is that I like their odds as long as another hurricane doesn't hit Florida around that time. I. I wouldn't be surprised if they launch on the first attempt. Well, second attempt. We saw a SpaceX Starship 24 and the Super Heavy Booster 7 stacked up on Mechazilla again. Now we saw a bunch of engine tests for Booster 7 in the last couple of weeks and they got up to many Raptors. I think, what did they get up to seven? I think at this point. There are a total of 33 engines. So now this is the fully stacked version of Starship and Super Heavy. In theory, this is the kind of rocket that could launch. And Elon Musk hinted that we would see this launch sometime in mid-November. Huh, mid-November. That's the same time that SLS is going to fly. I wouldn't be surprised if there's going to be a bit of a race for Starship to blast off before SLS does. Will it be ready? I don't know. Um, we will see. But the race continues. Hopefully in November, we will see the first launch of two enormous super heavy lift rockets. It'll be quite a month. Of course, again, my predictions, I really still like March for super heavy. So I think SLS is going to launch in November and I still think Starship is going to fly in March. Feel free to yell at me in the comments. I'm just I'm just following my gut, following my instincts and experience on how long these things tend to take. If you like what we do, consider joining our Patreon. This is a members only community that supports the work that we do at Universe Today. It helps us remain completely independent, allows me to hire all of the writers on Universe Today, video editors, audio editors, programmers. We've got a pretty big team at Universe Today and I have to pay all their salaries. So if you join our Patreon, you can help me pay them. But if you do, I will remove all of the ads from the Universe Today website for you for life. Even if you stop being a patron, just like sign up for three bucks, cancel immediately, boom, you'll never see an ad on Universe Today ever again. You also get behind the scenes information, you get advanced copies of some of the interviews that we do, and a lot of other cool special perks. So go to patreon.com slash universe today to sign up and support the work that we do. Whew, capstone is okay. A couple of weeks ago, I reported that NASA's capstone mission was tumbling. This is the CubeSat mission that's on its way to the moon. It's going to be following in a rectilinear halo orbit. And this is the same orbit that the upcoming Lunar Gateway is going to be following. And so the purpose of Capstone is to fly as a pathfinder along this trajectory, along this orbit, and make sure that it's going to fulfill all of the requirements that NASA has for when they actually build the Lunar Gateway. But the spacecraft started to tumble. And that's bad because it was losing power to be able to keep itself warm, keep its electronics warm. And NASA was concerned that they might lose the mission entirely. Fortunately, it was like just bringing in enough electricity to stay alive. And they were able to regain communications, able to reorient it, stabilize its tumble. And now it's back on target. It's no longer tumbling. And that's good because in early November, it had to do a final insertion maneuver to be able to actually get into this orbit around the moon. And so if it was still tumbling in mid November, when it needed to make this course correction, it wouldn't be able to make it. So very relieving capstones back in operation, we will learn if this is the best orbit ever. Spin launch continues their tests. This week, we learned that Spin Launch completed their 10th test launch with their prototype launching system. 
So this is a 12 meter centrifuge that takes a payload that looks a bit like a big dart. It spins it up to the point that the payload is experiencing 10,000 G's, and then it opens up a door and hurls it into space. The prototype can't go all the way to space. It goes on a suborbital trajectory. It goes tens of kilometers up into the air and then returns back down to Earth. This is the 10th time that they've tested it. And this test was pretty interesting because they had a whole bunch of test payloads on board, including one for NASA. And of course, NASA is interested if there's a way to be able to launch payloads into space with less fuel, less carbon emissions, NASA is interested. Now what will happen is in the full version, it's going to be much larger, it will be able to hurl these payloads almost into orbit, and then they will reveal a second stage that will carry them finish off their orbit, circularize the orbit, and now you've got the payload in space, but for a fraction of the propellant cost, because you're essentially just using electricity to get most of the way. Now I know that there is a lot of skepticism about the spin launch system. And I'm sure there are a lot of YouTube channels that you are popping into your brain right now when you hear about but this is the 10th test. NASA flew a payload on this rocket, I guess rocket bullet projectile. And hopefully they're going to be able to scale up to the next version, which they're calling the orbital mass launcher. And this one will go all the way to orbit. So we're still going to find out if this will actually work. But so far, it tests continue. And it's a pretty exciting technology if they can get this to work. If there are lakes on Europa, Clipper will find them. We are just a couple of years away from the launch of the Europa Clipper mission in 2026. But then it's going to take till 2030 to arrive at Europa, but we can be patient. It'll get there. So when it does, it's going to be in this really long orbit that brings it in and out of the Jupiter system. So it's not going to be in orbit around Europa, it's going to be in orbit around Jupiter. But every time it comes in, it's going to go past Europa, and it's going to take a bunch of data and images and so on. And this is to keep it safe, because it's a very radioactive environment around Jupiter, you don't want to spend a lot of time in that environment, you, you zip in, gather a bunch of information and then zip back out and send it all back to home, recollect your nerves and then the spacecraft will come back in. And so one of the big questions about Europa is like, we know that it is covered by this thick sheet of ice that surrounds this liquid ocean underneath. But the question is, how thick is the ice? Europa Clipper is equipped with an instrument called an ice penetrating radar, and it's going to be able to peer down through the ice and actually map out the structures under the ice. And so one of the really intriguing ideas is that it's not just say, 100 kilometers of solid ice or 70 kilometers of solid ice, but actually, there are pools and pockets and crevices and cracks. And the water has been pushing up from under the ocean and up into the ice in Europa. And the hope is, is that that this brings a potential for life very close to the surface, there could even be these geysers operating on Europa, like we see them on Enceladus. So the question is, will it be able to see these lakes if they're closer to the surface? And so researchers did a bunch of simulations where they looked into what kind of a radar signature would under ice lakes and ponds and cracks and crevices and rivers and things like that, what would it look like to Europa Clipper and good news, if these things exist under the ice, Europa Clipper will be able to find them. And so we're one step closer to getting a sense on whether or not there could be the conditions for life on Europa. We just have to wait till 2030. That's just like eight years from now. I'm patient. We did a couple of really interesting interviews this week. One was with Dr. Lucy Labou. She is an astronomer working on coronagraphs. And these are the instruments on board telescopes that block the light from a star so that you can reveal the much fainter planets nearby. And we get really into the weeds about how a coronagraph works, and what are the next level technologies that are coming online to be able to make these coronagraphs function and to really meet that goal of being able to observe an Earth sized world orbiting around a sun like star, you need to block the light from the star by about a factor of 10 million. And the next generation coronagraphs should do the trick. So if you want to hear how they work, you definitely want to check out that interview. 
I also talked to Colin Stewart, who is a science journalist and has written 20 books, tons of articles for New Scientist and European Space Agency and a lot of places, Sky and Telescope. And but he is recently been doing a lot of work on the sun, a lot of articles and research about the sun. And so we spent probably half the interview talking about the sun. And then we shifted into some other topics that he's been reporting on dark matter, dark energy, the usual. And so if you want to hear just a really fascinating conversation by someone whose job it is to communicate science, um, I think you'll really enjoy it. I had a lot of fun. And hopefully you've noticed the quality of the interviews has gone up dramatically. We're no longer live streaming them. Um, we're recording them locally and then doing a bunch of editing on them to make them higher quality. So hopefully that's working for you. You're enjoying it. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. All right, those were all the stories that we had today. Now you can get more information on any of the stories just down in the show notes below. Click the link, follow down the rabbit hole as far as you want to go. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There's no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news that we had today. We will see you next week.